Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Everybody have a good ride in? Anything interesting happening? So I started thinking about God's mother, and the leaves are just going everywhere across the road, so you can see exactly where the man came from. So I would imagine God's love, if you try to contain it, it just blows in the wind and is like scattered. So that's my mental image today. Would you please rise so we can uh, do our call to worship today, which comes from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. <laughs> I need glasses, so sorry. <laughs> so, um, how, how many of you learned that scripture a long, long time ago? It, when I think of the cubbies, um, a lot of the kids, it's one of the first things. For God so loved the world, he... I mean, how many of your kids learned that as well? I remember my two children. And hopefully, um, children in here, you learn that and you continue to hold that in your heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. 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 If you can join us by standing, if not, that's fine.
The next uh, scripture that we have comes from Deuteronomy. It's 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you.
Thank you, God's feet. Please remember that the phone is open up here. You need prayer or if you need to be close to God in your thoughts. Nevertheless, lay in on his feet.
Well, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. It's always good to uh, take a break and to experience God's goodness 
in rest and in solitude. I got to spend a lot of time by myself over the last, as well as with my family and my grandkids. Uh, it was really a wonderful time over the last 10 days or so, but I also got to spend a lot of time on my own, just in solitude with the Lord. And I tell you, I really needed that. Uh, I've told our elders, 2020 has been a tough year. Anybody, anybody agree? Anybody? Can I get a witness? Right? 2020 has been a tough year. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you've not given yourself uh, permission, if you've not given yourself uh, the moment to just get away with God for a little and, and have some solitude. Maybe it's on an evening. Maybe you get done with work one evening and you just go out and sit in the backyard for a while. Or maybe it's if you're a hunter like me, it's in a tree stand. And uh, you get a few hours of, of quiet out in the, uh, out in the woods. Where, wherever it is for you, I encourage you, especially now, to practice the discipline of solitude. That time of just being alone with God. Opening the Word of God, maybe take just one verse and uh, just meditate on that, but allow that time to just minister healing to your spirit in a year that has just been so chaotic and frenzied and scattered and all over the place. So I encourage you to take that time, spend that time with him. It certainly was good for me this last couple of weeks. We are beginning a journey that was going to take us probably about 12 weeks to get through the book of Judges. And uh, we may take a break for Christmas. I haven't decided yet whether we're going to go straight through, whether we're going to take a break break for the Christmas holiday there, and, uh, and then we'll join back in in January. But it's going to take us about 12 or 13 weeks to get through the book of Judges. Now, you might say, why in the world would you come to this book? Of all books. The truth is that Judges is the darkest book in all of the text of Scripture as far as I'm concerned. It starts bad, and it spirals downhill, into almost unbearable by the 21st chapter. Um, it is a really dark, chaotic, broken book. But here's the truth of dark, chaotic, broken books in the Bible. They're there for a reason. So why would I not go to greener pastures and quiet waters when I could have? Well, here's the truth. I want to give you a couple of reasons. First of all, it's where God led me. And first and foremost, that's the reason. I've prayed for many, many weeks where I would go at the end of 2 Timothy. And uh, God led me here. And God doesn't always lead me to the easy. God doesn't always lead me to the places that are fun to preach. He often leads me to places like Revelation and Romans and now the book of Judges. And, uh, and I'm just going to promise you wherever God leads me, I'm going to go. And I hope you'll go with me. So uh, believe me when I tell you that I believe God has a word for you over the next 12 weeks from this book. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be preaching it. So I encourage you to open your hearts to what God would speak to you through this passage of Scripture. The second thing I want to tell you is there's an importance for us to study and to continue going back to study Old Testament passages and Old Testament texts. If you remember from 2 Timothy, read this with me out loud. From childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. When Paul wrote that to his um, disciple, his uh, uh, young, his uh, young disciple Timothy, um, what passages, what texts was he talking about when he talked about these sacred texts that are filled with what, uh, what is able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation? Was he talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No, he was talking about Genesis through Malachi. He was saying to him, these texts that we have had and that you have been weaned on since childhood are able to give you wisdom that leads you to salvation. So how does an Old Testament text like Judges bring us to Jesus? It brings us first and foremost to the need for Jesus. But it also shows us this. Old Testament texts are points, or always point to a New Testament reality. What the Judges were in part or in type 
points to the perfect judge that is to come in Jesus. So if you don't understand the failure of the old judges, or at least what they represented, you'll never understand the Jesus, the Redeemer that Jesus was, that God was sending to us for eternity. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes this, Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, the they he's talking about, are the people we're reading about in Judges, and their parents and their grandparents. For indeed we had have good news preached to us about Jesus, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them. Say, did not profit them. The good news of God, the command of God, the blessing of God did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Now that is going to be repeated throughout the book of Judges. You're going to hear it from verse 1 through 3 all the way through the book. The inability of the people of Israel to, get, to gather their faith in the God they were following. They got the news, they got the word, they got the command, but they were unable to marry their faith to God's ability. And therefore they were broken and they failed. You'll see it even today. One last reason, the themes of this text speak directly into the world around us that we're living in. The first of the themes that we're going to go to are whatever, listen, in fact, read this with me. Whatever God wins the battle for your heart, wins control over you, and ultimately determines your destiny. Now I want you to do one thing for me right now. We're going to reverse that a little bit and make it personal. Every place this you see you or yours, say me or my. Can you do that? It's real easy. Just substitute the words and let's say it again. Whatever with God wins the battle for my heart, wins control over me, and ultimately determines my destiny. That is a theme of the book of Judges that's going to be repeated and played out over and over and over again. And you're going to hear me talk about this over and over and over again over the next 12 weeks. Whatever God wins your heart, whatever it is, if it's, if, if it's Yahweh, if it's, if it's Jehovah God... If he wins your heart, then he's going to control your destiny. But if the gods of, in their time, Baal and Asherah win your heart, they're going to determine your destiny. In today's world, if materialism and humanism and God knows what else grabs your heart, if it lures you in, if it captures your heart, then those things are going to take control of you and determine your destiny. Our devotion determines our destiny. What we are devoted to, remember from the book of Acts, what we are devoted to determines our destiny, where we will be. Second theme you're going to hear a lot is God's promise and plan is unfailing even when we are unfaithful. One of the great overarching themes of this book is no matter how bad Israel gets, and they get bad. We're going to, in this book, we're going to look at things like murder and rape and dismemberment and war and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, it's a nasty, dark book. It really is. Don't be scared of it, though. We'll, we'll deal with it. I promise. But even when Israel gets to its worst, God's promise is never failing. God's promise is never failing. He will work despite a broken people to bring about His will in the world He has created. You'll see that in the book of Judges. Last one is this. Failure of uncompromising obedience. Say uncompromising obedience. Do you know what that means? That means doing exactly what God says, when God says, where God says. It doesn't mean that we get to uh, negotiate with God about our obedience. I'll be obedient in this, but maybe not in this. Uncom failure to be uncompromisingly obedient to God leads to a downward spiral of moral and spiritual decay that culminates in bondage and slavery, which only a Redeemer can change. That's the picture in the cycle that's going to be repeated over and over in this book. Here's what the cycle looks like. 
there's sin and compromise that comes into God's people. Then oppression and bondage comes. How many of you know that sin always leads to bondage? That's all of you? How many of you know that sin always leads to bondage? Wow, I got to teach some of you. Either I got to teach you to raise your hand, or I got to teach you some truth out of Scripture. Let me give you an absolute fact that is true from Genesis to Revelation, and it is true from Adam to you and me. Sin always leads to bondage. You cannot sin with impunity. You cannot break the law of God with impunity. You cannot just do what you want to do and expect God to bless you. I know we've got a world that believes that's true today. But I'm telling you what the real truth is from the, from the text of Scripture. It's undeniable and you cannot, if you, can, if you can in any way in the text of Scripture defy what I just said, you show it to me. And I'll repent of what I said. But I've read this book over and over and over and over again, many times. And from beginning to end, that truth is made clear. Sin always leads to bondage. Bondage then leads us as a people to repentance. It often isn't full repentance, but it brings us to repentance because we don't want to be in bondage anymore. And when we repent, God is faithful to bring deliverance. Through a deliverer. We're going to call them judges in this book. Eventually, that, that redeemer, that deliverer is going to be who? Jesus. These are pictures of what is to come when Jesus comes. And that deliverer brings us back to peace. But then we sin again. And here's the problem with sin. When we make this cycle, we don't come back to the same starting point. If you see the circle this way, you think we come back to the same, same starting point. But if you turn it on its side, what you find out is you start here and you make the circle, you end up here. It's not a circle. It's a spiral. And every time sin takes control of us, we spiral back through. And eventually the sin gets deeper and deeper and the bondage gets deeper and deeper until a real Redeemer brings us out. And that's Jesus. That's the picture of the book of Judges. So, let's get started. To get you into verse 1, I want to give you a little background. A little history. God gave a command to the people of Israel. In Numbers, He says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out, say drive out, all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all, say destroy all, their figured stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places and you shall take possession of the land, say take possession, and live in it for I have given the land to you to possess it. What is the command of God when they come into the, come into the land of Canaan? Drive out some of the people. Drive out all of the people. Later, we're actually earlier in Deut Deuteronomy, he has said, when I bring you into Canaan, understand that I'm not driving Canaanites out before you because you're righteous. Deuteronomy 6.4, I believe. Maybe it's 4.6, I don't remember. Um, but he says to them, I'm not driving the Canaan outside of, out, of, uh, out of Canaan because of your righteousness. I'm driving them out because of their wickedness. And I'm giving you the land that I'm taking away from them. It's because of their wickedness that Canaan is. Canaanites are being driven out. And God says, I'm using you as my instrument of judgment. You are to go in and drive them completely off of this great land that they were on. Don't leave anybody behind. And when you don't leave anybody behind, make sure that you destroy all of their altars. All of their temples, all of the gods they have been worshipping. Because what they've been doing for 400 years is a decadent, depraved, debauched form of worship. They were, not only was it deeply sexualized, but they were literally sacrificing their children on altars to the god Molech and the god Baal. And God says, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore out of them. Just drive them out and destroy all of their worship. Destroy all of this false worship where they're hurting people. Just destroy it. Get rid of it all. That's God's command. 
God says to Moses a promise in Exodus 6. I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched hand with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Those four promises that are in bold are the four cups that are used in the Passover feast. From the moment of the institution of Passover until today, the Jewish people have celebrated these four statements and these four promises of God to bring them into the land. God reiterates this promise to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads. I have given it to you. Say, I have given it to you. Does he say you're going to have to take it? What does he say? I've given it to you. Every place, just as I spoke to Moses, no man will be able to stand. Say, no man. That's going to be very important this morning. All of this is not just background. This is important to your understanding of what's going to come. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Hazak Amatz is the Hebrew. For you shall give this people possession of the lands which I swore to their fathers to give them. Joshua, in his last speech to the people, gives them a warning. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you. Listen to verse 13 because you're going to hear it repeated today. Know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out before you, but they will be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Don't let that go, because you're going to hear that verse again in just a minute. You're going to hear that statement again in just a minute. That gets us into Judges chapter 1. I hope you've got your Bible. If you don't, make sure you bring it. Always important, going to to war without without your sword or without your gun, same as coming to church without your Bible. You ought to have a Bible in your hands. Don't trust that I'm telling you the truth. Trust that it's telling you the truth. Always have a Bible in your hand. I'm going to ask you to to underline some statements as we walk through this passage together that we're going to come back and revisit. Now it came about after the death of Joshua, the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord. Underline, inquired of the Lord. If you've got a pencil. Saying, who shall go up for us, first for us, against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said... Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Underline, Judah shall go up. And under underline, into his hand. It may say their hand, because when he says Judah, he's not talking about a person. He's talking about a tribe. Depending on your translation, he's, they're, they're going to either use that plural or singular. Then Judah said to Simeon, his brother... Underline said to Simeon, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted you. So Simeon went with him. Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into his hands, and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and found against and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai ben Bezek fled. And they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. I told you, this is kind of a gruesome book. Why did they cut off his thumbs and his big toes? He can't do anything now. He can't fight in, as a military person anymore. He can't hold a sword and he can't run in battle. It's a, it's a, it's a way of maiming a person. It was very common in the time. Listen to what he says next. Adonai don't, I don't know, said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. 
Kind of reminds of what uh, Paul says in Galatians 6, 7. Whatsoever a man soweth, he also shall reap. Even the ungodly man, Adonai Bezek, has to acknowledge that God has done to him what he has done to others. <clears throat> then the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Afterward, the sons of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country and in the Negev and in the lowland. So Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. And they struck Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai. Then they went... From then from there, he went against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name Debir formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, the one who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter Ash, Aksha, I think it's her name, for a wife. Othoniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, younger brother, captured it. So he gave him his daughter Aksha for a wife. Then it came about when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Then he alighted from the donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing. And since you have given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now let me make an aside here at the end of verse 15. One of the things that I did not put in as a theme of this book, but really is a theme as you follow is the treatment of Israel, of its women, of the women in Israel, is tied in with their descent into godliness. Godlessness. Not godliness. Godlessness. The further and the deeper we go into this book, the more farther away from God Israel goes, the more depraved their, their actions and their behavior towards the women around them in this text. Now, that's not a main theme, but it is a reality that I want you to be aware of as we read through these 21 chapters, because you'll see that it gets worse and worse and worse throughout the book. <clears throat> the descendants of the Kenites, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms, which is Jericho, with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad, and they went and lived with the people. Then Judah went, to, went with Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites living in Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. And Judah took Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon and its territory and Ekron with its territory. Now I want you to underline the entire next verse. Now the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. Just underline that. We'll come back to it. Then they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had promised, and drove out from there the sons of Anak. The sons of Anak were the giants in the land. Remember Goliath? He's one of those Anak boys. He's one of those guys. They gave, uh, and they drove out from there the three sons of Anak. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites... Underline, have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Underline that. Likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel and the Lord was with him. The house of Joseph spied out Bethel. Now they called the city was, now the name of the city was formerly Luz. The spies saw a man coming out from the city and they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city and we will treat you kindly. So he showed them the entrance, evidently a hidden entrance, not the main entrance. That would have been pretty obvious where the main gate was. Obviously, he showed them some kind of a hidden entrance uh, from which they could uh, get into the city. And they struck the city with the edge of the sword and they let the man and all his family go free. Kind of similar to Rahab. Remember that when they came into to Jericho? The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called it Luz, which, it's, which, it is, na which is its name to this day. <clears throat> but Manasseh did not take possession of Beth Sheen and its villages, Tanakh and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. Underline the next words. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. Verse 28, it came about when the Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So, underline again, Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. 
Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So, underline, Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko and the inhabitants of Sidon and, ah and Ahab or of Atzib or of Helba or of Aphek or of Rahab. So the Asherites, underline this, the Asherites, start with Asherites, lived among the Canaanites. Underline that. The inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anah, but, underline again, lived among the Canaanites. The inhabitants of the land and the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anah and became forced labor to them. Now underline all of the verse 34. Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan <coughs> into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the valley. Underline that. Yet the Amorites persisted in living in Mount Heres, in Ijalon, and Shavlet Shaalbim. Uh, but when the power of the house of Joseph grew strong, they became forced labor. The border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah and upward. Chapter 2, just the first five verses. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers, and I said I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Do you remember where he said that? I just showed it to you just a minute ago, back in Numbers. You shall tear down their altars. Remember that? Back in Numbers. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? God's question is to his people. What is this you have done? You have not obeyed me. Verse 3. Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will become a snare to you. Where did you read that? The warning of Joshua. Remember? I just put it up. We just read it. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people, underlined, lifted up their voices and wept. So they named the place Bochum, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. i got to get my water. <clears throat> I didn't get a swallow before I came down, and i got to drive through. So, we come to chapter 1 of Judges. And it begins very much like Charles Dickens when he writes A Christmas Carol. Anybody know how A Christmas Carol, that great famous work of Charles Dickens, begins? Marley. My daughter knows. Come on. That's it. Marley was dead, as dead as a doornail. <laughs> the beginning of Judges begins the same way. Joshua was dead, as dead as a doornail. <laughs> he was buried. And the reason it begins that way is because this book begins the third epoch in Israel's history. Its first epoch in history was born with Moses as he pulled the people out of slavery in Egypt, bringing them through the Red Sea and on to Sinai. Moses was the first to bring Israel into its own. They went from a group of people uh, that, that had descended from Abraham into a nation under Moses. Moses. Moses gave them through the voice of God, the law. He gave them their understanding of what it was to have judges and rule and authority and all of those things that they had never had as slaves in Egypt. Moses forged out of a group of slaves a nation. The first epoch of Israel. And Israel was a theocracy. Say the word theocracy. A theocracy means it's a nation ruled by God, governed by God, and led by God. This is what God designed man to live under. He did not call, he did not design man to live in a democracy or in a democratic republic or in an autocracy. He designed man to live as a, under a theocracy from Adam on. 
If you go back to Genesis, Adam was created and Adam had no ruler over him other than God. Who called the shots? Who gave him his instructions? Who gave him his authority? Who gave him his victory? Yes, God. God is in control. He is the king. He is the sole king of, a, of Adam until Adam decides to eat of a fruit. And then he's cast out of the kingdom of God, which exists in Eden. And he's put into the kingdom of the world where there is another God. What God is he now being ruled by? Well, the devil's out there too. But the devil preys on the, on the real God of his life, self. I'm God. And the devil just preys on man's desire to be his own God. To be his own ruler. To direct his own paths. To do his own thing. To do what he wants to do. And the devil preys on that. In all of us. And we move from a theocracy to a democracy of some kind where man rules man. But that's not how God created us. God calls Israel into existence under Moses. And Moses is the king of Israel, right? No. Moses is not the king of Israel. Moses is a spokesman for the king of Israel. Moses, over and over again, if you read those first five books, walks into the tent of meeting. Who's he meeting there? God. He gets his instructions from the king. He gets his marching orders from the king. He gets his authority from the king. When he walks out, he says, this is what God says for you to do. And the people say, either okay or not okay. And every time they challenge Moses' authority, what you find is that God comes out and says, when you challenge Moses' authority, you're challenging my authority. I told him what to do in the tent. You're supposed to do what I tell you to do. If you challenge Moses, you're challenging me. And over and over again, we see people dying in the wilderness, dying in the wilderness. Remember all those stories in Exodus, dying in the wilderness. They do this, they rise up, down there, dying in the wilderness. All these things happen because they challenge the authority of the king. They rebel against the king. In the beginning of the book of Joshua, Moses dies. First line of the book of, Moses, of, book of Joshua, Moses died. Moses is dead, as dead as a doornail. And Joshua comes along. And Joshua comes along and he becomes the king of the people, right? No. Joshua doesn't. Joshua becomes the general of God. Joshua has a different role than Moses. Moses was the lawgiver. Joshua is the general. Joshua, every time he inquires of God and does what God says, God gives him victory. Right? Jericho? Comes to Jericho and they say, well, how in the world are we going to get over these walls? Joshua says, I don't know. Let me go ask God. And God says, walk around the city seven times. Remember all that? But who's calling the shots? Joshua? No, God is. Joshua is just the general leading the army. And throughout the whole book of Joshua, we find when Joshua listens to God and obeys God, they have victory. And he brings them into victory in Canaan. And it brings us to the beginning of the book of Joshua. I mean, excuse me, the book of Judges. Joshua brings them overall command in Canaan, but not complete. It's left now at the death of Joshua for each of the tribes to inhabit and drive out the people from the land they have been allotted. That brings us to the third epoch of Israel's history. Now, we begin with Joshua is... Dead as a doornail. They no longer have a general. And the question that's going to be asked now in the first chapter is, how will Israel respond as a group of tribes when they no longer have a central figure like Moses or Joshua to bring them the word of God? Will they still live under a theocracy or will they fall to their own devices? That's the question. Let me give you the answer from the beginning. The last verse of the book of Judges says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the 350 years that spans the book of Judges, 
Israel went from a theocracy to anarchy, a place where man is ungoverned. It began with the first generation. But the descent was from God as king to having no king. And as we walk through the progress of this book, you're going to see the descent of what happens when you leave God as your king through the idea that you can become king to the idea that nobody is your king. And everybody just does what's right in their own eyes. Boy, that kind of looks like our, our culture today, doesn't it? We're grabbing at scraps, hoping that some man is going to lead us, that some guy is going to be, be good enough to lead us out of all of this, that some guy is going to be our, our savior of this, that some guy is going to lead us out of the captivity. But in the end, no man can lead us out of that but Jesus, who is the only redeemer and the only one in whom we put our faith. faith. And when we don't, we fall to the idea that everybody just does what's right in his own eyes. So how do you go there? How do you, how do you get there? How do you get in just a couple of generations from being, uh, being a, a people governed by God to a people who have no governance at all? Let's look at the fall of the nation. It begins in verse 1 with a good start. The people, I told you to underline what? They inquired of God. That sounds like a great start, doesn't it? Joshua's dead. They don't count the, the, bring together a council or a committee. They don't get a, a committee of the heads of the tribes and say, hey guys, what do we do? What do they do? They inquire of God. God, what do you want us to do? And I want you to see the faithfulness of God. They ask God, what do you want us to do? And God answers and says what? I told you to underline it. Judah shall go up first. And I will give the land into his hands. Now, I'm not talking about one man Judah. Judah is, is a tribe, right? It's the tribe of Judah. God says, send the tribe of Judah up and let Judah do his work because I'm going to give the land into Judah's hands. Sounds like a great beginning, doesn't it? A lot of us make great beginnings, don't we? You ever come to God, God, tell me what you want me to do. Show me what you will, show me your will. Show, guide me, guide me in what you want me to do. And God says, okay, and he gives you guidance and you get a good start. Doesn't usually finish that way though, does it? If, if I could stop here, then I could go, they inquired of God and everything, everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> How many of you know that this world isn't a fairy tale? And Judges isn't a fairy tale. It doesn't end there because the, in, by verse 3, verse 1, Judah shall go up. I'll give the land into his hands, this tribe's hands. Verse 3 says what? Judah asked Simeon, his brother, another tribe, Hey guys, come with us and help us defeat our enemies. Now you say, oh, Dan, now you're, you're nitpicking. I mean, come on. It, doesn't it just make sense to you? Judah's going to go to war and they're going to say, hey, look, you know, it's always better to have more than less. We'll, we'll take some other guys with us. That's a, that's a pretty small compromise, isn't it? In fact, most of the compromises we make in life seem small at the time. We make a small compromise with what God tells us, with what God's law is, with what God's will is for us. We make a small compromise that makes all the sense in the world. It just makes pure sense that if I'm going to go to war, I want to have more guys in my army rather than less guys in my army. So Judah says, Simeon, come with us. Is that what God told them to do? No. God told them. They inquired. God, what do you want us to do? And God said, send Judah. I'll give him victory. Now, let me tell you why this sin isn't as small as you might think it is. Judah's decision to take someone else with him. First of all, it, it disobeys what God said, right? I mean, that's, that's pure and simple. 
But here's the other thing it does. It discounts God's ability to give the land into the hands of Judah. Judah can't marry his faith to the promise of God. Remember where we started this morning? Judah is unable, as the writer of Hebrews says, he gets this good word, this good news, he gets this good word and this good promise, but yet he's unable to marry his faith with what God says. If he had, he would have just simply gone up. The tribe of Judah would have gone up and they would have had great victory. But Judah isn't able to bring himself to believe that God can deliver the land into his hands alone. He's got to ask somebody else to go with him. So now he's come to the point where God is king, but I am the general. So God is the king, but who calls the shots? Judah does. Now we see we're in trouble. But it doesn't start like trouble. In fact, you read a lot of verses where Judah is conquering the land. They're, they're Adon Ad 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 Adoniah Bezek, right? The great king goes in, takes him, cuts off his thumbs and his toes. You know, all this stuff. They have great victory until the first sign of trouble happens when we get to verse 19 and 21, 19 to 21. 19, I told you to underline completely. Now the Lord was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, and they lived happily ever after. Now the Lord was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but... Now let me tell you something. Look in my eyes today. Look in my eyes right now, and let me tell you something. You never want to hear, the Lord was with him, but... That is a really bad thing to read. What you want to read is the Lord was with him and, right? Because that represents something that God has done. The Lord was with him and he went out and conquered the land. The, God was with the apostles and they went out with signs and wonders following them to, to, to bless the world and to spread the news. The Holy Spirit was with them and the city was taken. You listen, all over. You don't want to read the word, but. Now the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country, but. They could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. Because they had iron chariots. Now let me ask you something. If that had read. The Lord was with Judah, and what would iron chariots have had to do with anything? Do you think iron chariots mean anything to God? If you do, go back to Exodus. Go back to the most powerful kingdom in all of the world, Egypt, and Pharaoh who says, I'm not going to let your people go. And God said, oh, yes, you are. And Pharaoh said, oh, no, I'm not. Through all of the plagues. Until finally God gets his attention. And what does Pharaoh do? He lets them go. Israel is not an army. They're a ragtag group of slaves that leaves Egypt. And they get out and they get their backs up against the Red Sea. And Pharaoh decides to change his mind. So he sends the most powerful army in the world up against a bunch of unarmed slaves and farmers. Do you think that matters to God? Not one iota. God just opens the Red Sea. They walk through on dry land. And God destroys the army of Egypt without Abra, without uh, Moses or the people ever lifting a finger to defend themselves. Judah comes in and conquers the hill country. But when he comes to the valley, there are iron chariots. And what happens? I can't take the valley. They've got iron chariots. I mean, come on, people. Don't be stupid. Look down there. They've got iron chariots down there. I don't have anything to compare to that. Really? Kind of sounds like, like the army when, when David comes along and the army is, is shaking in its boots from another son of Anak, Goliath. 
And they're afraid because they can't go up against this one Philistine. And David says what? I come against you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. You think your sword and your spear, you think your chariots mean anything to me? No! I've got God on my side. If Judah had walked into this being obedient and listening to the word of God and putting marrying faith to the promise, he would have walked in among those chariots and God would have defeated them. Their wheels would have turned off. He would have turned the ground to mud. These are things that he did in the Old Testament. We see it over and over again. God would have delivered the people in the valley into the hands of Judah. But what did Judah do? Hey, Simeon, you come with me because obviously God isn't strong enough to deliver these people into our hands. So you come with us to make sure we got enough people. Now, here's the key. Listen to me. Judah was successful in the world's eyes. He had taken a lot of territory in the hill country. He defeated a lot of enemies in the hill country. In fact, his brothers were probably saying, hey, look how great Judah is. Look at what all of Judah's done. Look, he's conquered all of these places. The only thing he couldn't do was go up against those, those chariots down there with those iron wheels. What do you think God's thinking the whole time? Is Judah successful in the eyes of God? What about when he takes out an eye of Ezek? Is he successful in God's eyes? What about when he takes the hill country? Is he successful in God's eyes? No, God blesses him despite his, his, his brokenness, despite how, well, his disobedience. But there's a limit. If you ever want to walk in the full blessing of God, you've got to walk in the full obedience to God. Are you listening to me? If you ever want to experience the fullness of God's blessing or the full blessing of God, you've got to walk in full obedience to God. You may compromise and be successful in the world's eyes. Maybe in your business, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your parenting, maybe in your, in your lifestyle, maybe in your life. You can compromise and be very successful as the world sees it. But you'll never conquer the valley. You'll never take possession of the land. You'll never be fully in Canaan when you compromise with your obedience to God. You hear me? Your business may make a lot of money, but you'll never be successful if you compromise your obedience to God. You may keep your marriage together, but you'll never understand the fullness of God's blessing and unity if you compromise with your obedience to God. You can live a life that the world thinks is great, but you'll never experience God's blessing if you compromise your obedience to God. Because you'll never conquer those chariots that remain in your life. That sin. Keep reading with me because you'll see that failure to push out all and follow all of God's commands leads to consequences. Because the decline begins in verse 21. Read 21 through and I ask you to, to, to underline several verses. In the middle of 21... So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin. Then on down in 27, the Canaanites persisted in living in the land. In verse 29, the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. In 30, uh, verse 30, the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. This is the first step of the decline. They were commanded to drive out Canaanites before them, to leave none in the land, and the first step of the decline is that who's living in the land with Israel? <clears throat> the Canaanites. The first step is the Canaanites lived with Israel. They lived among them. They lived there with them. You know, here's the truth of our sin. 
Our sin and our compromise leads us to a place where sin lives with us. It becomes some kind of a friend to us. We know it's wrong. It, you know, when we first sin, when we first compromise, we know it's wrong. And, and we sometimes even weep and repent about it a little bit. But then it just seizes into our lives. And, and suddenly that sin becomes something that we just accept. It just lives with us. And sometimes that's our inability to stop gossiping. Maybe it's lies. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's sexual sin. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, you can name a thousand things. But suddenly our sin no longer grieves us. We just kind of accept it as a normal part of our lives. And it becomes a companion that we don't talk about. It's the companion of our lives that we hide in the closet and hope nobody ever sees. That sin becomes that, that dark place in our lives that we, we always try to make sure we cover it up, that we, we, we shade it over, that we do something with it to make sure nobody else knows about it, but we don't really grieve over it anymore. We don't really, it doesn't cause us to repent. It doesn't cause us to come to God. We just, we just kind of accept it as, as a normal part of life. And for Israel, the Canaanites lived with them. And for us, our sin lives with us. Something that's left unconquered. It's chariots with iron wheels that, leave, that are left unconquered in our lives. It's closets that are dark and full of skeletons that have never been cleaned out by the blood of Jesus. And they live along with us. And it doesn't seem so bad. At least not if you're the frog in the kettle. The water's getting hotter, but you don't recognize it. The sin is getting deeper, but you don't realize it. Because it's just become part of your life. But I want you to notice the next step of the descent of this country, of this, of this culture. There's a change in paradigm in verse 31 and 33. Listen to these words that I asked you to, start to uh, underline. Verse 32. So the Asherites, who are the Asherites? That's Israel. It's one of the tribes of Israel. The Asherites lived among the Canaanites. It's subtle, do you get it? We've gone from verse 30 where the Canaanites lived among the Israelites to verse 32 we find the Israelites, what? Living among the Canaanites. Now that may be a small, and, and a small difference in wording, but it's meaningful. Verse 33, it says that Naphtali didn't drive out the inhabitants, but lived among the Canaanites. That subtle shift is absolutely powerful. Because what it says is, in the first, Israel had control of the land and the Canaanites lived with them. What's happening by the paradigm shift? Canaan has control of the land and Israel is living in it. And the same thing happens with our sinfulness and our compromise. It starts by being a, being a, a, a hidden, uh, uh, um, unwanted friend, but eventually it becomes the dominating factor of our life. That's what sin will always do to bring you into bondage. It's a slow process. It's a slow process of a small compromise with obedience to God that leads to sin being allowed to remain in your life and live alongside you until suddenly sin becomes to overcome, begins to overcome your life and it becomes the driving factor of your life because now you're trying to hide it from everybody and you're trying to keep up with all the lies you've told and you're trying to keep up with all the stories you've had to make up and you're trying to come up with all the ways to hide what's there and it begins to dominate your life rather than follow along behind it. That's the course of sin. The old timers used to say, a man takes a drink and then the drink takes the man. You heard that? A man commits sin, but then the sin commits the man. By that which a man is overcome, the scripture tells us, by that very thing is he enslaved. And that friend that you tolerated in your life because you didn't want it there, but you know you didn't really repent either. You just kind of carried it along. Soon will become the dominant factor and you'll be the one who's hiding in the closet. 
Suddenly Israel is living among the Canaanites. Now there's one last word in this descent. Verse 34 to 36. Told you to underline 34. Then the Amorites, they're the Canaanites, forced the sons of Dan, Israel, into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the valley. Do you see how sin has taken hold? Now we see the picture of Dan, who is in the tribe of Israel, being forced into the hill country. They are now being defeated by the Canaanites. They're not allowed to come to come into God's promise. They're not allowed to come into what God has promised them and has said He will give them because their sin has made them fall before the enemy. And in the end, folks, that's where sin will always take you. It starts as a little compromise. It just made sense. Right? More is better than less. It just makes sense. Why drive all these people out when we can force them to be our slaves and they can carry our water? And they can fix our houses and they can they can plow our fields and they can do all of these. Why push them out? Well, let me ask you this question. Why push them out? If they it, it, wouldn't it be better to just let them do all the labor? Why push them out? There's a simple answer. Because God said so. Why, why drive them out? The world says, don't drive them out. Keep them, make them slaves. Don't go fight against those guys in the valley. You've got the hill country, that's enough. Why drive them out? Why be obedient? Because God said so. And the only pathway to God's blessing is full obedience to His command. Do you hear me, church? It's the only way. Anything else leaves us to this place. This place where we are defeated by our sin. We are defeated by our enemies. We are never allowed to enter the promised land in full. We are never able to really live at peace in Canaan. Because our enemies are always overwhelming us. Because we allowed them to live with us. We allowed our sin to stay rather than defeating it at the hands of Jesus. And that sin will eventually overcome you and overwhelm you until the world overwhelms you. The judgment of God is in chapter 2, 1 through 5. You've not obeyed me, he says. Why? What is this that you have done? I wonder if God could ask us the same question. Are there places in your life that God would say, You have not obeyed me? What is this thing you've done, church? What is this thing you have done? Edna, what is this thing you have done? What is this thing you've done, John? What is this thing you've done in your life? Kurt, what is this thing? What is this thing you've done? You know my command. You know what I've told you. You know that I'm king. Why are you rebelling against me? You know what I've commanded for you. What is this thing you've done? If you're not obedient, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become as thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. Friends, if you're not obedient to God, listen to me. If you're not fully obedient to God, the things you allow to remain in your life that are not driven out will become snares to your feet and they will become thorns in your eyes and they will lead to the destruction of your life and your legacy. It's as simple as that. God is not going to compromise with your sin. He is king. Or he is not. They lifted up their voices and wept. And sacrificed to the Lord. And they lived happily ever after. Right? 
Like us, they lifted up their voices and wept because they were under conviction and they knew they had done wrong and they knew they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they knew they weren't doing what God had called them to do and they wept before God because of their sin and they offered sacrifices and the next day, do you know what they did? They went out and did it all over again because their tears weren't real and their repentance wasn't from the heart. They got caught. You know, the truth is for most people in the church today, their fear is not of doing something against the heart of God or sinning against the heart of God. Their, their fear, their real fear, is being caught by man and somebody knowing what they did. Let me tell you something, folks. I shudder to think of, the, of people finding out all the sins that I've committed in my life. If I, I, I really wouldn't want you to watch a videotape of, of God, you know, displaying a videotape of all the wrong I've done in my life. I'd be pretty ashamed of that. But let me tell you something. I'd much rather you see it than for him to see it. I'm far more ashamed of my sin because of the holiness of my God than I am because you might think less of me. Either God is king or he's not. What are the takeaways? I'm going to close. Partial obedience is no obedience, no obedience at all. Listen to me. Partial obedience to God is being disobedient to God. It's as simple as that. God is not going to negotiate with you about how obedient or not obedient you are. He's not going to go, well, you did some of the stuff I told you to do, but not all of it. So well, I guess it's okay. Just keep on doing it. Either God is king or He's not. And either you are going to walk in His blessing or you're not. But don't expect to be disobedient to God and walk in the fullness of His blessing. For your marriage, for your family, for your home, for your business, for your life. Don't expect to disobey God and still walk in the fullness of His blessing. It's not going to happen. You may find some worldly success, but you'll never find success in the eyes of God. The spiral begins slowly at first, but it builds in momentum. Dale Davis wrote this, and I thought it was really good. What began as tolerance or toleration became apostasy. What seemed so reasonable proved lethal. Living with Canaanites led to worshiping with Canaanites. Tolerance of Baal's people and tolerate by Baal's people and sooner or later you bow at Baal's altar. But it seemed like a rather small matter at the time. Well, most of our compromises seem a pretty small matter at the time. And yet they lead to, lead to such great destruction in our lives. Simple. You want to be blessed? How many of you want to be blessed? Let me see your hands. I still got to teach some of you to raise your hands. How many of you want to be blessed? This is not rocket science. You want to be blessed? Obey God. Fully. Completely. Surrender. Make Him your king. You cannot be king and allow Him to be king. You've got to step off of your throne and off of your podium and off of yourself and give Him kingship if you want to be blessed. We have been called out of the domain of darkness into His glorious light and we live in a kingdom where Jesus is King. Let me ask you something. Does your life demonstrate what it looks like to live in a kingdom where Jesus is King? That's what it ought to look like for Christians to live in this world. To demonstrate what it looks like to live in a kingdom where Jesus is king. You see, when I accepted Christ, he became king. And from now on, it's all about what he wants, not what I want. It's about going where he sends me, not where I want to go. 
Why am I preaching from the book of Judges, this dark, ugly book? Because God called me to do it. And if he said go, I'm going to go. I don't get to pick and choose. You go where he calls you. You walk where you're led. You do what he tells you. And when you blow it, go back to God because you've got a redeemer in Jesus Christ that says all of your rebellion is forgiven. And you are made right in the heart of God through the blood that I shed. He has, God has declared an absolute general amnesty for all rebels. He has declared an amnesty for all rebels. Everyone has, who has rebelled against the king, everyone who has taken up arms against their king is forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ unconditionally. If you have rebelled, you are made right through the blood of Jesus Christ and allowed access into the very kingdom of God that you rebelled against. And he says, now you, you won't come in as a slave. You won't come in as a pauper. You won't come in as, as, as something low. No, no, no. When you come back into the kingdom through Jesus Christ, you come in as a son of the Most High God. That's what forgiveness looks like. But what begins as toleration becomes apostasy. What seems so reasonable proves lethal. Living with Canaanites leads to worshiping with Canaanites. Toleration of sin. Toleration of sinful people. Toleration of Baal's people. And sooner or later, you will bow at Baal's altar. But it will all seem like such a reasonable small compromise in the beginning. Last thing. Partial obedience may lead to worldly success. But it never leads to the blessing of God. This morning, I encourage you to discover where your heart really is with the king. Is he king? Or is he something else? If he's something else, you're a rebel. If, if God is anything but king in your life, then you are, you are a rebel. That's it. You've rebelled against the rightful king. He is God. He is creator. And if you're a rebel, let me give you hope. Jesus came to set rebels right with God. And you don't have to do anything except come to Him and receive the cleansing of His forgiveness. And He will wash the sin out of your life. He will wash your past whiter than snow. He will take what is what is is. is uh, dirty and filthy rags and he will wash them whiter than snow he will bring you from being a slave eating at the pig slop you remember the the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the wayward child he'll bring you back home and make you a son or a daughter and when you come back into the kingdom it's nothing but a ring and a robe baby you don't come in as a servant. You come in as a son. You come in as a daughter of the Most High God. With all the rights and privileges bestowed upon a son or a daughter of God in the kingdom of God. And then you get to live as a demonstration of what it looks like to live in a kingdom where Jesus is king. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. I live in that kingdom. I walk in that kingdom. I work in that kingdom. I love my wife in that kingdom. I love my children and my grandchildren in that kingdom. I love you in that kingdom. And I want to tell you something. There is nothing better than the kingdom of God. And nothing more precious than the blessing of God. And nothing more wonderful than being free from who I was to be who I'm becoming in the kingdom of God. And that's the truth. Let's pray. Father, today is a day where we have to come to a conclusion about who you are. Hashem, the name, God. We hallow your name. Sometimes, Lord, we hallow your name in word only. 
Show us those places in our lives where we are not hallowing Your name and the way we live. Show us those places in our lives, Father, where we have, we, have, we have tolerated and we have compromised in our obedience and we've accepted sin as a friend rather than an enemy and we have, have even sometimes become dominated completely and defeated by that sin. And God, I pray that where we are sinners, You would forgive us and You would deliver us into the peace of the kingdom You have promised us. God, I want nothing less in my life and I want nothing less for the lives of the people who are here today and those who are watching online and those in Lewisburg and those everywhere that are within the reach of my voice. I want nothing less than the land of Canaan, the land of promise, the land of freedom, the land of hope, the land of eternity and rest that is found only in you. And I want them to stop nothing short. As great as Moses was, he stood on the mountain, could only see the land of promise. God, I don't want to see the land of promise. I want to live in it and I want them to live in it too. So God, come. Holy Spirit, come. Show us our sin. Show us our brokenness. Show us our compromise. Come, Holy Spirit, and, and speak into our lives about what is wrong that needs to be made right in Jesus. And then lead us to that freely given gift that you have given a Redeemer in Jesus Christ who says, come to me as you are, just as you are. And I will make you new. Marry our faith to the promise. Marry our faith to the promise. And let us walk in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Matt, when you look at that clock, pay no attention to it because it's completely wrong. It really is. I'm only nine minutes over. Like Dan runs to his own time, huh? That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't quit preaching the word. Good morning, friends, and welcome. Uh, we hope again and we pray every week that you experience the living Christ through his living word today in this worship service and that it continues from here wherever you go. I want to welcome any visitors or guests if you're here for the first time or you've been just coming and checking us out online or present. We would love to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, stop by and say hi to us. Uh, you can drop some information in the offering boxes if you want. If you're online, you can actually go to HughesvilleFriends.org or our Facebook page and connect with us. We'd love to know uh, who you are and get to know you. Lots of announcements, so I'm going to go fast. There are two Christmas-related announcements. There's one, uh, if you are not aware, we do a program every year called Touch a Heart. Touch a Heart is where we uh, offer to buy gifts for children in need in the community. And there is a sign-up sheet out there, and today is the last day. We've been advertising this for a few weeks. Last day to sign up if you would like to uh, help out a child in need here in the community. The other one that's related to that is the shoe boxes, Operation Christmas Child. Many of you have probably heard of that. Uh, that deadline is next Sunday. So uh, you do not have to use the pre-packed boxes or the, the cardboard boxes. You can use your own. Uh, but if you want to pick up information back there, there's information on what you can put in one of the boxes. And you have one more week to get those turned in, and they will go to a child in need around the country, around the world. Uh, a couple other little announcements here, uh, just to keep going through. If you are interested, if you've been checking us out, you've been here, and you're kind of becoming part of the family a little bit, and you would like your own mailbox, we would love for you to have a mailbox. Or you can also engage in getting uh, on our online directory. Both of those, uh, the person you would need to see is Mary Hockaden. Um, so we will get you connected with Mary if you're interested in a mailbox or getting into our directory. Uh, I believe next Saturday, Pastor Dan's going to be running a membership class on the 21st. That's two Saturdays from now, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. Uh, two Saturdays from now, on the 21st, if you are thinking about uh, joining our church and becoming a member, uh, please see Pastor Dan. We'd love to have you in that class. On the 22nd, both of our recovery ministries, Divorce Care and Grief Share, are offering a, a seminar called Surviving the Holidays. Uh, so the information is out there on uh, how to get on there. If you go to our website, we can get you information. But we'd love for you to invite anybody that is just going through a tough time. If they've lost somebody uh, or if they're experiencing divorce or separation, the holidays are a very, very difficult time. And uh, we have a special seminar just to try to help them on this Sunday the 22nd. I 
told you there's a lot here. I think I need a glass of water. Um, last two things. You may have seen a box out here for Friends Feeding Friends. We are actually uh, collecting hats, scarves, and gloves this time. So if you have extra hats, scarves, and gloves that are gently used or new, uh, if you want to pick some up, drop them in there. We'll be giving them out at our food ministry. And then last but not least, in case you did not hear, there is a group of us, and everyone is welcome, that's going out to the Turnage's house today. Uh, Nick and Lindsay Turnage, you may have been hearing us talking about them over the last few weeks, months. Uh, Lindsay is still bedridden and uh, having a lot of trouble, and so we are going to literally surround her house in prayer. So if you are interested in doing that, and you do not know where they live, uh, please see me or Pastor Dan or Joe. Um, we can kind of get you directions. We're all going to be meeting there at 2.30. They're in Millville, uh, and we're going to literally surround our house in prayer uh, just to bless them. Okay, I'm done. Have, have a great day. God bless. Social distance hug.